Welcome to another week's analysis behind the news. A number of things we're going to discuss to, uh, this week, and I think I'll start the, the discussion off with school cheating. Now, you would think that this is cheating on the tests by the students. Well, you'd be mistaken. It's cheating by the teachers. Here in Atlanta, Georgia, for instance, 11 school administrators and teachers were found guilty of uh, altering the tests. Uh, erasing answers and filling in correct answers and that sort of thing to bring up the level of the results of their students. And the funny thing about this is that uh, over at the Freedom Project Education School, uh, the administrator there, Alan Scholl, put out a LinkedIn uh, to this sort of a, a problem. Uh, it wasn't this particular article because this one came out of the uh, Los Angeles Times. But an administrator from one of the top four cities in the country came back and said, this is more normal than abnormal, this cheating going on by teachers and school administrators. Now, you might find that hard to believe, but here it says the last two paragraphs in this article. The Atlanta school cheating trial is the most extensive of recent cases that have plagued districts across the nation in the data-driven era of No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. A 2013 report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office said that officials in 40, 40 states detected potential cheating in tests given to public school students between 2010 and 2012. Now, when you take money from the federal government based on your test results, this is what's going to happen. People are going to cheat, and it won't be the students. And uh, you see this thing more and more with this idea of Common Core, where all these things are test-driven instruction. Nothing deviates from the test-driven instruction. No one's allowed to go anywhere outside these boundaries because these tests depend so much on how much grant money you get, etc. So. These are part, part of the problems that are creeping into the schools where we're sending our kids to become moral uh, citizens, uh, honest citizens, and that sort of thing, and then their teachers and administrators are dishonest. What does that say about the school system today? And it's, as this administrator said, normal, and as this article said, in 40 states. That's, uh, you know, four out of five states. At any rate, here's another one where people are not being exactly honest with us. Uh, and that's in the CONCON fight, the Conference of, of State, the Convention of States, the, the Constitutional Convention, and that sort of thing. There is the National Constitution Center. Let me read to you what the National Constitution Center is. The first and only institution in America established by Congress to disseminate information about the United States Constitution on a nonpartisan basis in order to increase the awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. They just posted, as this morning, uh, as this is being uh, taped, an article called Doing the Math for a New Constitutional Convention. Several lines in here that are very striking, but just let me read one to you. In the scenario of a balanced budget amendment convention, Congress would need to establish who can attend the convention to finalize the wording of a single amendment, or if such a convention can propose multiple amendments. I want to read this thing again because this is very important. This is established by the Congress of the United States, and this is what they are saying to the people relative to these conventions because they're saying Congress won't have anything to do with it. In the scenario of a balanced budget amendment convention, Congress would need to establish who can attend the convention, in other words, the delegates, and to finalize the wording, or to finalize the wording of a single amendment. You see, these proposals they, they are not even the finalized wording relative to a proposed amendment. The finalized wording takes place at the convention. 
So you may call a convention thinking one thing and get something else entirely out of it. Or, if such a convention can propose multiple amendments. In other words, you think that you've called a convention for a single entity. Well, that's something that we've been trying to tell people, is you can't. Because once the convention is convened, it's, it's carte blanche. However, let's say that argument is not valid. They are saying basically that Congress will decide. So either way, it's a lose-lose. Somebody is not being exactly honest with the people who are voting for these things at the state legislative level. And they're trying to convince the legislatures that they will be the, the uh, people who will administrate this whole thing. That's not true. Here's a very interesting article out of uh, the Financial Times last week. And uh, the article's headline says, Pakistan approves order for eight submarines from China. Well, that's not the only aspect that's interesting. It's only the headline that caught my eye. Because I know that there has been this closeness between Pakistan and China for a long, long time. And in this article, it says that Islamabad, in other words, the capital of Pakistan, has long been Beijing's top arms customer, driving China's emergence as a big exporter of military hardware. Pakistan bought more than 40% of China's arms exports over the past five years. And now that's very interesting, because when you see that sort of thing, that closeness uh, between these two, I know that they buy their fighter aircraft uh, from China and that sort of thing. This is the country that we have been uh, counting on in the war on terror, for instance, Pakistan. And yet they're far more close to uh, China than they are the United States in so many things. Uh, they've got a joint uh, oil pipeline that they're working on together. Uh, they're working on several proposals. They've even got joint uh, military exercises with, with Iran, for instance, uh, and they're very close to Iran. They claim they've not given any arms or nuclear uh, information to Iran, uh, yet there are some reports that say that's not entirely accurate. And so we are helping Pakistan in many, many ways, and yet they're in bed with China and Iran and, and all the rest of them. And if you go to the uh, New American website, you can connect there from here, you'll find many articles on this tie between Iran, China, and Pakistan. And the last thing I want to bring up, and I only bring these things up, for instance, in the way of Pakistan, is to give you a little more understanding of some of our foreign policy and how it doesn't quite fit with what they say out of the executive branch of our own government as to why they're involved in these things. Political battle ramps up over Iran. It seems as though the president wants to make a unilateral treaty, so to speak, with Iran. In Congress, you just better stay out of it. You know, you don't make treaties without including at least the Senate of the United States. It's not done. And yet we have a president who thinks that he is, I don't want to say he's a god, because I don't think he really believes that he's a god because he is not the President of the United States. He's simply the mouthpiece for a coterie that put him into office. The man has no background to be President of the United States. He's never even held a real honest job in a profit-making company, for instance. He was a street organizer and friends with known communist terrorists. That's how he got his start. They elevated him into the legislature, from there into the Senate of the United States. It reminds you of other people around the world over the years who really were nothing and elevated from the streets up to the leadership of their countries. Uh, Adolf Hitler comes to mind, for instance. But these are the kinds of people that get in there and they think they can just do as they please as long as that power structure is in place allowing them to do it. Now, the reason for it is that there are people in the Senate, in leadership, and in the House, in leadership, that allow him to get away with what he's doing. They belong to organizations. They have family ties with others uh, in these 
Council on Foreign Relations type, New World Order type organizations. And they allow the president to get away with these things because they don't want the American people to know what's really going on. You know, all you got to do is look at the head of the Senate of the United States to his wife. His wife is Chinese. And she and her family are in bed with the leadership of the communist apparatus in China. They're very close. That should bring alarms in anybody's head as to maybe we should take a closer look as to some of the policies in relationship to foreign policy that is involved with the Senate and its leadership. The same way with the House, with Boehner being involved with the transatlantic policy network that wants to merge the United States with the European Union. You start to look at these people and what they're involved in, then you see why Obama gets away with doing what he's doing. Take a closer look. Until next week, we'll see you then.